Alrighty, it's about that time. So welcome and welcome back. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, welcome online and in person to Concordia University's fourth space. Thanks so much for joining us for Research That Matters, Sustainability, Biodiversity and Justice in a Time of Ecological Crisis. Day three, a welcome back for this keynote talk towards a more internationally equitable science with our special guest, uh, Rasim Khalifa, who's here with us in the space today. We are streaming to YouTube live from Four Space. Four Space is located on unceded indigenous lands here in Jojage, Montreal. And we'd like to extend our gratitude to the Kanyankahaga Nation, uh, who are the caretakers for the lands and waters we're meeting on for their teachings about the earth and our relations. If you're new to Force Space online or in person, we're so pleased that you could join us today. We work with our university community here to mobilize and exchange knowledge by co-creating daily activities, uh, one, two, three, or four events per day. It's a busy space, there's a lot going on campus. So it's our pleasure to have collaborated with the organizers of this conference uh, all week here today for various activities, workshops, and talks. Um, I will be passing it over to our moderator, Jim Grant, here in just a sec, but before doing so, sorry, Jim, one more thing. I wanted to let you know that during uh, uh, after the uh, Racim's talk here today, there will be time for exchange for some questions. So if you're joining us via Zoom, please uh, make our lives easier by raising a virtual hand and we'll call on you to speak. Otherwise, you can you're more than welcome to put any ideas into the chat directly and we'll read them out. And if you're here in the space with us, wonderful. Just let us know that you'd like to speak by raising a hand and we'll get a microphone to you so that we can hear you online. Okay, that's it for me. Hi, Jim. Hi, Anna. Thanks very much for that introduction. You left me with little to say. It's great. Um, and thanks, as always, to Force Space for uh, collaborating with us uh, for our annual conference. Um, as Anna said, this is the uh, last event of day three. Two more exciting days, if you want to check online about our schedule. And we're ending on a high note, a keynote address by Rasim. So on behalf of the Loyola Sustainability Research Center and the Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability, welcome to our annual conference. Um, much of the research in sustainability is about land and place. So thank you, Anna, for that uh, territorial acknowledgement. It's, it's, it's important and even more important for our work. Um, most of us here are uh, obviously from Jajoge, but if some of those online are tuning in from off island, uh, I encourage you to you know check out uh, uh, more about the land on, on which you're situated right now. So on to our final event, um, our keynote speaker, Dr. Rasim Khalifa. Uh, Dr. Khalifa is the newest uh, faculty member in biology. We're delighted to have him. He's a quantitative ecologist. He does lots of really cool, uh, you know, pure research on the effects of climate change, other anthropogenic factors on the spatial and temporal dynamics of biodiversity. Uh, he does pure research, but he also does applied, uh, he applies that knowledge to trying to protect biodiversity. And he's really impressive. He's published some 57 papers in some of the best scientific journals in the world. And so when we looked at his, uh, when we were hiring, our search committee was very impressed with the CV. But even more impressive to us was the work he does as an activist and as a scholar on EDI in science. And Rasim is uniquely placed to do this as a North African ecologist. Uh, there are not many North African ecologists in Canada, I think. Uh, he did his bachelor's degree and master's degree in Algeria and his PhD in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. So he's seen both sides of Western science and science in a less developed country. Um, then he did his postdoc of University of British Columbia and then we snagged him from UBC to come here. Um, Rasim's only been in our department less than a year. He's already established, uh, you know, a uh, a discussion group on EDI within our department between faculty and graduate students. He started a social hour every week to create more community within the department because that's crucial to uh, to this process. I could say a lot about his activities about EDI, but I think I should just turn things over to Rasim and let him tell us. He, he'll do a much better job. So Rasim, please take it away. You hear me okay? Thank you, Jim. Thank you for this nice uh, introduction. And thank you all for being here. And thank you for inviting me. 
It's really my pleasure to give this presentation. It's really an honor. Uh, my name is Wasim Khalifa. My pronouns are he and him. And I am a new assistant professor at Concordia University. Uh, I am based at Loyola campus and the beautiful uh, and city territories of the Ghanaian nations. And in my research, I'm interested in different things, but mainly uh, understanding causes and consequences of biodiversity changes, in particular, phenology and geographic distribution dynamics. And I'm also interested in a sustainable solution for biodiversity conservation. In my work, I use theory, field work, experiments, and databases to answer my research questions in collaboration with uh, researchers, NGOs, citizen scientists, farmers, etc. I, as a, as a scientist, we I use and generate knowledge and tools to advance uh, our research field, but. I'm also a strong advocate of having the wisdom as a scientist and uh, being advocate of equity, diversity, inclusion, and justice. Oh. I think you made your own chair. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You missed on the pretty slide. You're seeing more quickly, sir. All right. Sorry, I was not sharing my slides. And yeah, you missed some nice slides. Uh, it's fine, there's gonna be more. Okay, so I would like to give a little bit of background by myself. Uh, I was born and raised in Algeria and I attended school in Algeria. And uh, at school, you first language you learn is Arabic. And then uh, in primary school, you learn French and in secondary school you start learning um, English but in everyday life we speak a dialect the Algerian Arabic and so technically English is our fourth language so from pri primary to high school it's mainly Arabic when you go to the university you want to do a, a scientific field uh, you switch to French but this year uh, Algerian higher education will shift to English. This is a side note if you're interested to know about the challenges. Uh, I wrote a, a piece in science that was published uh, last month. And so I did my bachelor and my master's uh, in Algeria and I, I did ecology. I was really interested in biodiversity conservation. I studied different species of birds and insects, especially dragonflies. I did field work, laboratory experiments. I explored the many uh, sites in different parts of the country, and I attended local conferences, etc. And so I had the, ex I experienced how it is to be like a, an Algerian researcher. And then I went to Switzerland to do a PhD at the University of Zurich. Uh, I quickly noticed the big difference in terms of infrastructure, the opportunities of funding, um, access to books and articles, and uh, uh, the proximity to elite researchers and the better English fluency too. I remember when I went to the admission office, uh, they told me that I had to take 27 credit which is more than double what's normally required. It's only 12. So I went to my colleague who was from UK and asked him, hey, uh, how much credit are you required to take? He said 12. I was like, wow, uh, how many years did you study at the university? He said three years. How many papers do you have? Zero. Okay. And so I compared it to my background, I did eight years of study at the university. And at that time, I already had like six first author papers. And still, I had to take more than double the credits of uh, my colleagues. So it was pretty unfair, but I had to go through it. And so I, I lost more than a semester, I, I remember, to finish my 
PhD doing courses. And what I also noticed is that there is difference, big difference in research culture too. In Swiss labs, there is a big push to publish in high impact factor journals uh, because you actually can. Uh, uh, back home, if you do your best, you can publish in a pretty good journal, but locally, it's very impressive to publish in, uh, in English and in impact factor journal, but Switzerland, you present the same paper to a professor and he would not be impressed at all. And so there is big difference in terms of uh, expectations. And so I graduated, I got my PhD, and then I moved to uh, Vancouver at the University of uh, British Columbia to do postdocs. I really enjoyed my time there. Um, and the academic environment was pretty similar to that in Switzerland, but the proportion of native English speakers was extremely higher. And uh, so it was really, uh, I was, I went from an unprivileged environment in Algeria where English, English fluency is very low and you don't have many privileges to a, a super privileged place. And so we started a discussion group, an EDI discussion group, where we talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And this really made me think about my personal academic past and the disparities that exist um, at the international level. And so I wrote different papers on that during the past couple of years. And it is undeniable that it, there is international disparity in academic opportunities and success. And here is one example. This graph shows the proportion of highly cited researchers from the global north. Between 2014 and 2021, in six biological fields. And as you can see, it's pretty stable and it's higher than 90%. In my field in ecology, for example, if you look at the top publishing ecologists, it is mostly also from, they're mostly from global north, especially US, UK, Australia. So rich English speaking countries, uh, they dominate the uh, most influential journals in our field. And ecology is just an example. If you look at other fields, you're gonna see pretty much the same thing. So there is a lack of international representation and diversity. Whenever I talk about diversity, I really like to introduce or integrate geographic scales because wherever you go in the world, you find diversity of people. And of course, there is differences uh, in privileges uh, within each diversity. Back home, I also live it within a, a diversity of people. But the true diversity is the global diversity. It's when we assemble all the different diversities. And what's interesting is that we know that there is individual differences within each diversity, but we should also recognize that some diversities are more privileged than other diversities. Uh, so it, this way of looking at diversity is interesting because it makes you think about uh, the different factors that operate at the local scale and also at the global scale. And so there are different determinants of academic success and opportunities. And I, I try to capture both local variation and global variation in the same framework that I called here the KLOB, which stands for Knowledge Exchange, Language, Obligation, and Bias. These different um, components, they contribute into your probability of success in academia. For example, Knowledge Exchange it's, uh, it depends on the economy of the country, the, the prestige of your institution, the supervisor and professor who train you, and your networking potential. All of these determine how much you know and how much opportunity you have uh, to exchange knowledge. Then we have language. 
my slides froze. We know that science is mostly in English and your knowledge of English determine your probability of success. And the language or the, your proficiency, proficiency in English, it depends on your nationality, your, um, your training, uh, your residency, etc. I have trouble with my, it just froze. Sorry for that. Um, back to it. And then we have the uh, component called obligation. And this is something that uh, usually people don't really take, uh, take into consideration. Uh, we have financial obligation, family obligation, administrative, etc. For example, if you, have, if, if you do a PhD and you work at the same time because you can't afford uh, uh, you can't afford uh, doing a PhD, you have to work. And some, someone who is wealthy and who doesn't have to uh, work at the same time, well, they will be more um, productive. And same thing with family, like childcare, etc. And so obligation tend to explain local variation in academic opportunities. And Finally, bias. We know that there is discrimination against certain group of our society. And as you can see, discrimination is just one component of the entire, um, of the potential factors that can affect your probability of success, especially if you look at the global variation in academic opportunities. What's interesting is that many of those factors are correlated. So if you have one, if you have one barrier, you're more likely to have another barrier. And you have, if you have one privilege, you're more likely to have another privilege. For example, the GDP per capita is positively correlated with the average English uh, fluency. Richer countries tend to be more fluent in English than poorer countries. And it's also correlated with your ability to travel and go to conferences. And so we, we have a situation here where you either have many privileges or you have many barriers. And these correlation, they deepen the, uh, the gap in uh, academic success between uh, countries. And so the question now is, is science truly accessible to everyone? When I say accessible, I'm, I'm trying about equitable um, access to science. Usually when you, uh, one definition of open science is the movement to make scientific research, including publications, data, physical sample and software accessible to all levels of society, amateur or professionals. This is a naive definition that uh, it doesn't really capture the real equitable open science. Um, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that science is an industry that produces um, uh, knowledge, tools, data, software, etc. If we make these products accessible, it uh, doesn't mean that we made the industry accessible. There is, it's an entire ecosystem. We should talk about who is producing this product and who is deciding about which product should be published or, or produced or promoted. And so it's more complex than just say, okay, let's make the product available and we solve the open science uh, problem. So now I'm gonna look at open science through four different lenses. The first lens is the naive lens, uh, access to the product of science. Then we have the production lens. We have our ability to share the product through conferences, for example, and being part of the decision making. Let's start with the access lens. We know that the paywall is a big problem. 
we we have been there. We, we try to read the paper and all you have access to is the title and the abstract. And there is a big difference in privilege when it comes to accessing these journals uh, between universities. Some universities have more access than other universities. And so if you are from a, an unprivileged background in, in, in poor country, you don't have access to, to those journals. And so the, the, the solution that was presented to us is, yeah, we should shift to open access. You have to pay in order to get your paper open access to everyone. Uh, what this solution did, it just shifted the problem from uh, not being able to read to not being able to publish, because now you need to pay to publish a paper. And how much is that? Well, it varies between a couple of thousand dollars to $10,000 to publish a paper. In the case of Nature, for example, it's 10K. This amount of money is a huge for some countries. You can't really public, you can't really pay that. And there is no funding for it. And I know people who pay it out of their own pocket. And it's, it's like three monthly salaries. Uh, and so it's not really equitable the, the, to have such a solution of open access. And so now let's say we don't have these problems. It's open, everything is free. Let's imagine a world where everything is free. You have access to the paper and you don't have to pay. Can we say that we solve this issue of open science? Well, we need to talk about the content now. It's one thing to have access to the PDF of the study. It's another thing to have access to the content of that PDF. Because imagine a world where all papers are in Arabic just like that. I believe it will be a nightmare for many people. It will be heaven for some. Well, as much as it is a nightmare for many people, it is also a nightmare for many people to be in the current state, only using English. And so it's important to keep this in mind. It's not only a matter of making a document available. It's also a matter of accommodating different languages. Now let's look at the production lens. When you want to publish a paper and be part of the scientific community, you must write your paper in English. And in the author guidelines of most journals, you, you find this statement, authors for whom English is not their first language may wish to consider using a professional editing service before submission. How much does it cost? Well, here's an average across six Publishers. Standard editing, it's around $250. Premium, it's around $400. Translation is even more expensive. And so we are talking about being able to submit the paper. It's not, your paper is, is still has to go through the peer review. So to avoid immediate rejection, you need, well, the journals tell you, yeah, we, we don't want bad English. We, we want only good English and to, to have good English, well, you, they invite you to go and pay. Same thing, $300, $400, it's a lot of money for uh, unprivileged uh, scientists. And we already established that researchers who have low English proof, uh, proficiency, they tend to come from unprivileged backgrounds and so, this is not equitable. And it's not only a problem of language, of course, there is a big difference in funding opportunities um, that are also biases. And there is also a big difference in research culture. And so even if you get your paper uh, ready, 
with good English, then you have to convince the editor that your research is exciting to the editor. I'm going to get to that. Now let's talk about the sharing lens, being able to share your research in international conferences, for example. Usually we have to travel to go to international conferences. Um, and to travel, different people from different countries have different privileges because we have the visa-free score. For example, my passport, my Algerian passport has a score of 64. I can visit 64 countries without having to ask for a visa. For a, a US passport, it's 172, so it's almost three times. Um, I was invited to give a, a, a talk in California, and I had to go through an application, a visa application, and it was annoying. <laughs> um, it's, you have to, you have to fill forms. Uh, in my case, I had to go to a different city to, to do the interview. You have to pay. Then you wait a couple of weeks to get your passport back. In my case, I got the visa, but many students and researchers usually do not get, get their visa and then cannot attend these international conferences. We have seen that in last year at the joint meeting of uh, the Ecological Society of America and Canadian Society of Ecology and Evolution. Many talks from African and South American uh, students were canceled because they, they did not receive their visa. And this is a, um, a reoccurring problem. And it is a missed opportunity for them to connect with people, to get their name known by the scientific community and to uh, get to know the recent advances in the field. Okay, let's jump into the, uh, the last lens, the decision making, being part of the decision making. And here I'm going to focus on editorial boards. As you may know, journals have editorial boards, and those are experts in the field. They decide which paper should be published. And so they have a huge influence on, 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 on science in general. So we look at, at most influential journals in ecology and evolution. And we look at that, their affiliation and determine their um, yeah, the geographic distribution and representation. And we found that only 13% were from the global south. Editorial boards are mainly dominated by researchers from the US, Australia, UK, and Canada. And so there is a, a huge lack of diversity in editorial boards, especially from Africa, South America, and Asia. And we don't know the consequences of that in terms of decision. Uh, editors are just human. They have implicit biases. We don't know whether having a less diverse um, editorial board can affect the decision making. Uh, this study was published a few days ago, and it shows that authors from less privileged countries, they tend to get more rejections and they tend to submit to more journals before acceptance. And so it is likely that there is bias and this bias might be due to this uh, lack of diversity in editorial boards. So we failed to see true equitable open science across all these lenses. And it is important to consider diversity of perspectives and to look at open science, not only from one perspective, because the solution that you come up with looking through one perspective might not be very effective. And especially if you are in a privileged position, then your vision of the problem is very limited. 
Uh, and I have a funny example here. Person number one saying to, who is in this situation, he's the most privileged person saying to person number three, if I had binoculars, I would enjoy the game much better. Person number three doesn't understand what person number one is saying because with the binocular, this is what you would see. So one solution from one perspective might not be a solution from another perspective. And this is why we need to have diversified perspectives. And so why should we care about diversity and inclusion? With diversity, we have a wide range of uh, experiences, background, perspectives, and ideas. And this usually tend to increase our innovation and creativity, improve uh, the problem solving, and enhance productivity and effectiveness. And this is really crucial because we are dealing with planetary issues uh, like climate change, biodiversity loss, and so we really need uh, the opinion and point of view of uh, many people around the world to solve these issues. But our current ability to solve them is still very limited by the lack of inclusion of diverse perspectives. Here's one example. We still use mostly English literature when we perform literature search and meta-analysis to understand global patterns. For example, in the field of biodiversity conservation, one third of the literature is in non-English uh, languages. Uh, imagine you have a data set and you do your you do your analysis and you get results. Now, try to repeat the same analysis, but remove 30%, rond randomly third, like 33% of the data and see what happens. See whether the, the magnitude of your effects are the same. See whether uh, the direction of your effect is sometimes the, what was significant is no longer significant. And, what was not significant is now significant. So there might be a big difference uh, when we do not account for non-English literature. And we tend to think that most literature is, or all literature is in English. Most of it, yes, but we know now that in some fields like biodiversity conservation, the number of papers published papers in non-English languages has increased during the last decades. So this part of the literature is increasing. It's not decreasing. And there have been studies showing that with multilingual search, you get more geographic coverage, uh, a more diverse pool of taxa, and there's potentially more reliable results. And in conservation biology, I would say that we, we, really we, we really know and appreciate international conservation just because a single species can uh, span across multiple countries in terms of geographic distribution. So if you want to protect a species with such a geographic distribution, you need to not only collaborate and combine efforts, but you also need to know um, the literature, whether in English or not in English, to be more and more effective in protecting it. So what are the solutions to promote international representations? There are many and still, uh, still need to debate about it, but it's really important to think about uh, making articles, data, and codes publicly available and preferably in different languages. And nowadays we have artificial intelligence, we have um, machine learning trans uh, translation tool that really do a good job at translating. So journals should really think about that and integrate um, some sort of um, and translation tools in, in, in their platforms. 
when it comes to production, we should foster ethical international collaboration and value diversity of perspectives. For example, we did an analysis on uh, PhD students from Algeria, Colombia, Mexico, and Morocco, and we selected a group of students who did not uh, collaborate internationally and a group of students who collaborated and we compared uh, the impact factor of the journal they published it in. We saw that it was higher when they collaborated internationally and the citation rate they received. And it was also significantly higher when they collaborated internationally. So I think there is value into promoting international collaboration. When it comes to sharing the sharing lens and being able to attend conferences, I think we should promote virtual conferences because it's it doesn't cost a lot and uh, we should really welcome international researcher to um, promote these collaboration and the ex exchange of knowledge. And finally, we should really diversify editorial boards and reviewers. Um, because with more diversity, we have more diversified perspectives. And we tend to reduce also uh, implicit bias. And I think one of the most important things we should do is to raise awareness. And you could do that at, uh, it doesn't have to be at the big scale, but just around you, for example, at the University of in Cordia, the biology department, we started uh, an EDI discussion group where students, postdocs, and professors uh, discuss issues around EDI. We discuss papers, and we sometimes suggest solutions. And it's and it's a nice uh, environment, fruitful, and it's always insightful. And so, if we do that across all departments in different universities. I think we can really come up with really nice solutions uh, because uh, nobody has the ultimate answer and we need to collaborate to get this answer, the right answer. And so to me, equitable open science is a movement that promotes equitable access and participation in scientific research, knowledge production, academic networking, and decision making. It's not only about uh, accessing the product of science. And it's also a movement that promotes transparency, accountability, and inclusivity in all aspects of the scientific process. And it aims to ensure that the benefits of scientific research are distributed fairly and evenly, both locally and internationally. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank you again for your invitation. Thank you. Well, Racine, thank you. Thank you for that very powerful and, and biographical. I, I, I enjoyed the biographical part. I knew part of it, but that was nice to see. So thank you. I, I want to remind those on, on Zoom that you can um, uh, put, put a question in the chat or raise your virtual hand and we can uh, listen to you here. But I'll also ask, are there any questions? I think maybe we should call it there. And thank you for giving us so much to think about. Maybe LSRC should be thinking about this, doing things at the university level. Uh, so Racine doesn't have to do it all. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so thank you very much, Racine. Thank you. I'll pass things back to Anna very quickly, but I'll just say uh, that ends day three, but we have two more uh, active days. Please check our website. Everything's listed there. Uh, Anna, should I pass things back to you very quickly for anything? Sure, sure, sure. Why not? Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming in. Have a great evening. And those of you uh, on Zoom will be closing up that space now, but reminding you that the recording is already available on our YouTube channel. Check out Fourth Space on Concordia University's YouTube. Okay. Bye, everyone. Have a great night until tomorrow.